Okay, this is Dr. Keith again. You guys have hopefully read through and watched the videos here for the chapter one in databases, and you've learned a little bit about what it means to normalize data by, uh, uh, if you remember that gold star example, we had a whole bunch of data that um, was combined that needed to be separated into some separate tables or separate places and then tied together with something called primary keys and foreign keys. Anyway, if you went, went all the way to the end of the chapter there, you also learned how we implement those uh, spreadsheet uh, data tables into an actual database, relational database management system like Access. So what I want to do today is walk you through the process of creating these databases, excuse me, these relational databases conceptually before we ever implement them in Access and before we ever have any data. We simply want to think through what are all the possible tables that we might need. So let's go back to that Excel file we were, we were working on previously and uh, go from here. Okay, so let's introduce you to some key terms first. Remember how before I told you that a database um, is similar to a spreadsheet, but we just have different names or different terms to refer to similar things. So in a database, each one of these things would be represented in a different table. Well, let's back up and talk about um, entity relationship diagrams. So I'm going to call this ERD here. And we'll say in ERD language, we represent a table with what's called an entity. We represent a record as an instance. And we represent a field or a column as an attribute. Oops. Sometimes we call these properties, properties or attributes. Anyway. All right. So what I want to do is assume I don't have any of this data yet. And I want to think through the same ordering system. Um, but in terms of the entities, attributes, and instances that will be represented and put into a diagram. So as the name diagram implies, we're going to need to be able to make some drawings. Now, uh, you could do this on a whiteboard, on paper with pencil, but obviously since I'm trying to do this on a computer, we're going to use something electronic. So I want you to use Lucidchart, or uh, you're welcome to just do this on paper if you'd rather. But, but anyway, here, Lucidchart's a pretty good option to do things electronically. Anyway, I'm going to assume that you've signed up, gotten your free account. I'm just going to log in. Uh, feel free to use paper for now if you don't want to have to use this or come back later after you get your account. You do have to sign up with, I, I believe, a .edu email account, and that's how they validate and give you a free account. All right, log it in. So uh, here we go. I'm log So you create your account first, and then you can request an educational account back on that last page that I was on. Anyway, I've already got one. So I'm going to go back to the home page, go to Documents. All right, I have a bunch already created. When you log in, have your free account, you're not going to see anything here. What we want to do is create a new document. Chill and wait. Okay, so you'll see some symbols over here we can use. Uh, flow charts will come up later in the semester. We don't want them right now. I'm going to get rid of those. I guess we could leave shapes here. Um, you know, just go down here to more shapes. And what we want right here under software is entity relationship shapes. Click that, hit save. I'm going to move those up here to the top. All right. So we have a few different options. Uh, honestly, there's lots of different ways to make ERDs. There is one standard notation. But in practice, uh, there's many different things used. I want you to use this symbol right here. Click and drag this out. Let's recreate that order processing system that we had before. This one right here. So I've got a customer, order, product, order line item. Let's represent these in an ERD. So right here, let's make this the customer table or the customer entity. So that's the name of the entity, kind of like it would be the name of the table. And then I have a bunch of fields. And then whether or not these fields are keys. Well, typically in an ERD, we'll specify the primary key first. If you remember from the previous chapter, this is going to be that unique, uh, that field number that represent that uniquely identifies every record in a database, every row in a table, or every instance in an entity. So I'm going to designate this as a primary key with the PK right there. I'm going to change this field to say customer ID. Now, I know I called it something different over here, account number, but no worries. We're, we're going to change things up a little bit. Now, for a primary key, I could use anything that uniquely identifies a customer. So address, would that be a primary key? No, because you've got multiple people living at the same address. 
Phone number. No, you could have multiple people with the same phone number too, possibly. Email. Most people have their own email address. However, if you move on in information systems or accounting or certain degrees, they'll get into a lot more depth than we're going to get into here when it comes to creating ERDs and databases. And you would learn something about indexes. And we typically like to keep indexes numeric so that they're quicker to search and sort on and pull information out from. So in this, what, I, what I'm getting at is that even though we could use email address as a primary key for customer, let's go ahead and create a customer ID field. And we call this an artificial key because it has no other purpose other than to be the primary key. If we were to use email address, we'd call that a semantic key. Semantic because it has meaning other than being a primary key. It's useful for other things. All right, primary key, what else do we have? Well, probably some sort of first name, last name. Oh, look, I have some options here. I like this one. Go back and forth and make uh, every other field gray. Uh, we'll probably store some type of phone number email address. Again, these are all called attributes. Now, I'm not going to specify every single attribute of customer. That's not the purpose of an ERD. Uh, the purpose is to simply map out the relationships among entities for now. So I'm just going to throw a few of these in here and not worry about the rest. All right. So to place an order, we've also got to keep track of orders, obviously. Let's go ahead and just create those uh, uh, same entities we had in our previous example. We'll call this order. You'll notice um, in the previous video, I call these customers and orders. I removed that S because a more common naming, naming convention is to keep this uh, singular, keep entities. Uh, it's not tense. What's the word I'm looking for? Anyway, we don't make them plural. So order, let's make some type of primary key. An order number would be a good ID, or maybe an order ID since I've been started with customer ID over here. What else do we want to keep track of about an order? Well, probably some sort of order date. How about some kind of um, payment type? Now, in the last example, I did keep track of order total. In reality, we often will not store or create a field for order total because that's something we can calculate from the order line items table. But don't worry about it. For now, it just helps us conceptually understand what would go here in this orders table. Let's do one more. Maybe, um, how about shipped? Whether or not this order's been shipped. Let's say we're an online store. All right, so think back to Gold Star and to our orders example we did previously. We had to use foreign keys as well in order to make it so that uh, we can tie these tables together. Uh, hopefully you remember from the last video why we took the primary key from customer and moved it over to order it's so that we uh, uh, wouldn't have any uh, blanks and it makes it easier to add orders. So the way we decide where to put a primary key or a foreign key is based on the relationship between these two entities. So a customer can place how many orders? Well, obviously many. Now when we record an order, how many different customers can that order be placed by? If you remember back to here, an order is placed by one customer and only one customer. We want to draw a line that connects these two that represents that, that relationship where a customer can buy many orders and an order can be bought by one customer. Just click right here and let's, whoops, no, not right there. All right, see, watch what happens when I, if I hover over that, I don't want that square or that cross, I want that one right there. See where it turns skinny? click like that and drag over here and look what it does. It made this tick mark here and these, we call it crow's feet over there. What these things mean, the crow's feet mean many and this tick mark means one. What this is saying, we read it from left to right or from right to left. If we read it from left to right, we include, we ignore this symbol on the side we begin reading from and we read the symbol on this side. What this means is a customer can place skip this one, many orders. Now if we read the opposite direction, we do it like this. An order can be placed by, skip this one, one and only one customer. That's what these things mean. This is a one-to-many relationship, one of the most common in ERDs or entity relationship diagrams. So this represents this relationship. Now oftentimes when we do ERDs, we won't even include any of these attributes. We'll just have an entity with a name, 
and this relationship between that these two two entities. It's always between pairs of entities. However, I've added a primary key in. I've added some attributes in. So let me be more specific, kind of like we were in that access diagram, or sorry, that that uh, when we built out the uh, the tables and access here in this last video. You'll remember we uh, got into that relationships tool, and there were some symbols, an infinity symbol and a little uh, one. Um, that's similar to exactly what's happening here. And in Access, we were specific and we related it from one attribute to another. So let's do the same thing. We're In order to relate these two entities, we're going to take the customer ID from customer and put it over in the orders table. Now, if you remember, that's exactly what we did here in this uh, Excel example. Oops, let me pull that back up. We took the customer account number and we made it a foreign key over here in order. Now, how do you know which one to move to which side. How do you know that you need to put account number over here instead of taking order number and putting it over there? Well, let's see if I can use this data right here um, as an example. So if I put account number over here, then every time I place a new order, there's only going to be one account number associated with that order. So I can simply have account number as another field. However, if I try and do that the other way around, let me show you what happens. Let me move this out of the way a bit. Oh, I can't change merge cells yet. All right, I get it. Let me insert this right here then. Let's say that Homer Simpson um, places an order. So I'm going to move order number over to this table and say Homer placed order number one. Okay, well, Homer also placed, if you remember right, he placed order number three. Okay, so where do I put order number three? In the customer table. Hmm. Well, I could say order number a second time, and then I could say he also placed order number three and put it right there, and say Marge placed order number two. Well, the problem is, um, what if Marge never places a second order? Well, then I've got multiple orders for Homer, and I've got to create a new column for every order he makes. And who knows if Marge will make that many orders as well. I could end up having blank cells for her, waste of database space. I can't create a new column on the fly for every new every time Homer makes a new order. Uh, databases aren't made that way. We're meant to create and add rows on the fly, and many people at once can add rows or edit rows. We're not typically meant to add columns or database fields on the fly. By on the fly, I mean as the database is up and being used and, and entries are being made. So that's not the way to do it. All right, well, our other alternative is, oops, I didn't mean to do that. Undo. Our other alternative is when Homer places order number three, we can add another row. Homer Simpson, account number one, placed order three. Well, what's the problem if I do that? Well, I just repeated Homer Simpson again. The whole reason I separated customer from order is so I wouldn't have to keep repeating Homer's name. So I can't do that either. On the other hand, if I take a count number and move it over to the orders table, like I said before, there's always just one and only one customer for every order placed. So I can just have one filled and add that one customer account number every time there's a new order. It's nice and clean. Now, like I may have said before, uh, this is a rule we can follow. And it's great in IS whenever we have rules we can follow because we so rarely do. And when we do, you want to make sure you memorize it. Here's the rule. All right, let me go back. In a one-to-many relationship, you will always take the primary key from the one side and make it a foreign key in the many side. Let's do that right now. I'm going to make this an FK. And I am going to copy or move customer ID over here and put it in the order side. And what that lets me do, I can now actually be a bit more specific with this relationship. I can move it from customer ID to customer ID. And if I do that, whoops, I could also spell it right. It actually doesn't matter what I call this right here. I could call it purple monkey dishwater for all I care. As long as this line goes from here to here, that means that the number, whoops, ah, the number right here, account number, when it appears in this column, even if this is purple, purple monkey dishwater, we know that this one means 
account number one over in this row. These column names don't have to match up. All right. So uh, let me undo this one too. Okay. We have the relationship from customer to order. Let's add a product in here. Okay. I'm going to do the, the wrong way again like I did in the last video so you can understand why it's wrong. Let me add product in. We're going to have a primary key. We'll call it product ID this time. We'll have some other things like product name, uh, maybe a price. Uh, why not? Let's add a cost. Every product has something we buy it for and then an amount that we sell it for. Delete, delete, delete. Okay, what's the relationship from order to product? Well, let's draw the line. See how it automatically it always does this one to many? Um, actually, something, let me back up a second. I forgot to do something over on here. We also have what's called a minimum. Um, excuse me, this is called a cardinality. This one here and this many here, we call these the cardinalities. There's actually three types of cardinalities. There's a one to one, where I have a tick mark and a tick mark. There's a one-to-many, and this could go either direction. And there's a many-to-many. -many. So I have crow's feet on both sides. What I haven't talked about yet is the minimum cardinality. Well, let's do this relationship, and then I'll get to that one. So notice as I draw it, when I click from one side and drag to the other, it automatically does this one-to-many. And it would do that the other direction if I clicked from here and dragged over there. It makes that one one-to-many. That's just logic of lucid chart. However, in this case, I've got an order that is can have multiple products on it but a product can be can appear on multiple orders so it's not one to many anymore this is a many to many relationship so I have crow's feet on both sides so see this little tool here where I changed whoops not that one I have to click on this first it gives me a bunch of these different options here so I want to talk about minimum cardinalities as well so let's start over here a customer. Are we going to record a customer even if a customer has never placed an order before? Hmm. Well, that's a business decision. And that's not something I'm often going to mark you right or wrong on. There's very few cases where that really matters. Uh, you may buy a bunch of customer data from somewhere uh, and load it into your database and then start trying to send them advertisements. So that's one scenario where you might record customers even if they never placed an order. So let's record, we call that the minimum cardinality. A customer, can they place zero orders? In other words, will we ever record them without having them place an order? If so, then we'd actually use this symbol right here. And we read this as, a customer can place zero to many orders. Here's a question for you. Will we ever record an order without a customer? Now again, this is a business decision, but I can't think of a lot of scenarios where you would. So what I'm going to do instead is I'm going to change this to this one right here. What this means now, I have a maximum and a minimum cardinality. An order can be placed by, must be placed by at least one customer and at most one customer. So notice the minimum cardinality is always on the inside and the maximum is on the outside. So an order must be placed by one and only one customer. That's how we read that minimum cardinality. Well, let's do this over here now. An order. Uh, will we ever record an order if there's not a product on that order? I can't think of a good reason why we would. So let's change this to one to many. An order must have at least one product, but can have many products. Will we ever record an order? Uh, sorry, will we ever record a product if it doesn't appear on an order? Mm, yeah we will. We'll have lots of products and some of them may not have sold yet. So in that case, a product could appear on zero orders, but may appear on many orders. So we call these our minimum and maximum cardinalities. The minimums are always on the inside, the maximums are on the outside. We read a relationship between two entities. Uh, dep depending on the direction we're re reading that relationship, we always include um, the relationship, the cardinality, on the opposite side of the direction we're reading. So an order must appear on, uh, sorry, an order must contain at least one product and may contain many products. Product may not appear on any orders, but may appear on many orders. A 
customer might be recorded even if they've never placed an order but they could place many orders an order will be placed by one and only one customer so that's the relationship among those now as you may remember from our uh, example in the previous chapter we have this order line items table because we need some way of keeping track of everything that appears on an order so uh, whenever there's a many-to-many -many relationship and here's another one of these rules where it's an always Whenever you see a many-to-many -many relationship, and I'm referring to the maximum cardinalities, not the minimums, there will always be a linking table, or sometimes we call it an association class or association entity, in between that many those two entities. And we're going to represent that one, just like we did in the last chapter, with an order line items table. And this gives us a chance to list out every single item on each receipt. Order, line, item. So we always take those many-to-many -many relationships and we flip the many's in here to face this linking table in the middle. So an order, we read this as, an order may have many line items on it and a product may appear as on many different line items. Each line item is going to represent one order and one product. So remember back to our prior example. Here in our order line items table, we pulled the primary key from the orders table and the primary key from the product table. We made them foreign keys on the order line items table. And then for each one of those, we included a quantity and then a unique ID. Now this was unnecessary, but I'll come back to that in a minute. So remember that rule where I said previously we always take in a one-to-many relationship, we always take the primary key from the one side and make it a foreign key in the many side. Well, in this instance where we used to have this many-to-many -many relationship, we follow the rule where we put a linking table in between, and then we flip these relationships around, and we do this every time to where the many faces this, this linking table in the middle. And now that it's a one-to-many relationship, that means we're going to take the primary key from the one side and make it a foreign key on the many side. So I'm going to stick order ID right here. I'm going to stick product ID right here. And I also am going to keep track of quantity in this table. So uh, let me do my little alternate thing. There we go. All right, so uh, we could include a primary key called line item like we did before, or line ID, but it's actually unnecessary because if you remember, the combination of foreign keys actually is a unique ID in itself. So see right here, order one has product one. Will order one ever have product one again? Will we ever need to list that twice in the two separate rows? No, because if product one is purchased twice on order one, we would simply update the quantity to quantity two. So this unique combination of one, one will never appear again anywhere in this table. Same thing right here, two, one. Will order two ever have product one twice? Well, if it does, we'll add it here to the quantity. So what we sometimes do is rather than include line ID as a primary key, we can simply say that the combination of order ID and product ID is a primary key slash foreign key. The combination of these makes up a primary key and each one in of itself is a foreign key representing something in a different table. So either way is fine. I'm going to do it this way this time just so you can see an alternative. Okay, let's do take care of minimum cardinalities now. Oh, and actually, sorry, let's move these relationships so they point to the proper things. Order ID goes to order ID. Product ID goes to product ID. There we go. All right. So, will we ever record an order line item if, it, uh, if, a, a, if an associated order isn't also created in the database? In other words, what's the minimum cardinality from here to here? Uh, no, we won't will only ever record a line item if there's an order it's associated with. Will an order um, 
Can we place an order without having any order line items at all? Uh, no. It could have many order line items, but there's not a chance we'll ever record an order without at least one line item. So our minimums here are ones. All right, over here on this side, product. Will a product ever not appear on an order line item? Yes, we established that previously. It's possible to uh, have a product in the database that simply hasn't been sold yet. Will an order line item have a product on here uh, that is not stored in this table as well? Nope, we'll only ever put a product in here if it also appears in that table. So the minimum cardinality on this side is one. Okay, this is your first ERD. Uh, watch this video a second time if you can. What I'd recommend doing for practice is hiding this or starting a new one. Go back to this Microsoft Excel worksheet that you may have made before and see if you can create the ERD based on this. Hope this all made sense. Uh, see my educator for another example.